Okay, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can see what I see here on my screen. This is Taylor Sharp. Uh, this is August 13th, 2022 at the Apple Corps of Dallas Super Saturday monthly user group meeting. Glad to have everybody here. Uh, hope you guys uh, are doing well and staying cool this August. So uh, we actually got some rain this week, which was kind of uh, enjoyable. Not enough, but hey, better than than nothing, but uh, we're going to talk about uh, Apple Mac and uh, if it's good for small business and what are some of the tools that are out there. So we're going to whiz through a few of these things. I'm Taylor Sharp, longtime uh, member of the Apple Corps of Dallas, and um, also uh, I use my Mac in my business full time. So uh, I'm used to using some of these tools that we're going to talk about and a lot of others that <laughs> I don't use too, we'll talk about. But uh, anyway, so basically this is kind of making a case for is the Mac still good for small business and what are some of the tools that are out there and why we can uh, should use it. So to start off with, we're going to talk about uh, reason number one. Well, uh, the big reason out there, uh, Apple certainly is uh, taking uh, the lead in many ways uh, that uh, in the chip manufacturing CPU into things that uh, hadn't really existed so much in the past. We always talked about uh, when we had a, the first supercomputer and things like that, but we always were at best just kind of hanging with Intel until Finally, FileMaker jumped over, excuse me, Apple jumped over to uh, doing, um, you know, the Intel thing. And so we've done Intel for a while until Apple started making their own CPUs. And the first one being the M1s uh, that are out there in the Mac Mini and the uh, iMac and some of the MacBooks and things. And these are actually uh, some very, uh, you know, Serious, uh, for, for basically a first CPU version out there, they hung very well with the Intel, AMD, and other things. They were competitive. They were not necessarily uh, significantly faster, but they held their own speed with uh, longtime competition that had uh, set the standards out there. Uh, but one thing that is different is that Apple is actually designing these things in-house. And this gets back to the old philosophy that uh, Apple had where they want to control the whole experience, not just the operating system like Microsoft, but the hardware. And of course, they've been controlling the hardware forever, but they've never been the OEM of some of the things like the, you know, CPUs, storage, cache and stuff like that. And they have definitely jumped into that big time these last few years. And, uh, and because of it, they are really able to integrate um, uh, some of the things in ways other companies can't. Uh, one way that uh, I will really point this out that a lot of people don't realize uh, how powerful it is, but they're now able to do the unified memory. I don't know how many of you heard of this unified memory, but basically uh, in the past, uh, you had your CPU and it had its memory and you had your video card and it had its memory and you maybe had a GPU and it had its memory and you had each of these things had their own memories and their own caches, which meant that, yes, that was fine for that, but the, none of it was shareable between, you know, the, the video card and the um, uh, CPU could not share the same memory or the same cache, you know, those were just totally separate. Well, one of the benefits of Apple controlling this whole process and building these processors is they're able to build a unified memory that can be shared among all these different things, among other things, so that if one of the uh, type needs, if you need more CPU or if you need more video graphics or whatever, that that uh, the spare uh, um, capacity uh, and, and these other things can be shared and you can you know, make better use of the amount of, you know, RAM or cache that you have. And this is actually a really big deal that helps uh, you know, the Apple hardware work a lot more efficiently. Uh, of course, some of you out there may have re uh, remembered WWDC. We have the new Apple MacBook Air with the M2 processor. A anybody got the M2 out there? Wave your hand if you do. Well, uh, not yet. Well, uh, I'm thinking about buying one here real shortly. I'm surprised Lawrence hadn't beaten me to it, but uh, the uh, M2 is also a, a fairly powerful uh, processor. 
it basically uh, improves speed anywhere from 10 to 20 percent over the M1. It's, it's not lightning speed faster, but it's a little bit faster. And so it's certainly uh, an improvement there. So we're going to move on here to really the reason number two is if you are using a mobile computer, that means you have a laptop, well, battery is the name of the game. And Apple is kicking butt there. <laughs> These M1s uh, using their four nanometer technology uh, just um, you know, th these, these laptops that are coming out now that uh, Apple has, they're rating them at like 18 to 20 hours of battery life, you know, doing normal processing and use. That is amazing. That means, you know, you can go through a normal workday without any problem with just battery if you needed to and didn't need to plug in. So some of the big advantages of Apple making their, uh, these M1 processors is they have basically been learning from making the um, iPhone and iPad, well, particularly the iPhone CPUs, how to make uh, a, a CPU that is extremely light on the battery because it was needed for the iPhone. I, everything thing about a phone is, uh, how long, you know, how long can I have my phone's battery last? And if my battery only lasts four or five hours, that ain't going to make cut it through the day. So a Apple has spent a lot of development technology R&D on getting battery life improved on the um, iPhone uh, CPUs. And now they have brought that in the M1s and the M2s, a lot of that technology that they have learned over here into these. And the real benefit is the uh, uh, length that you're going to be able to get of battery life on a laptop. It's not such a big deal on, um, uh, you know, like a Mac mini that you plug in the wall. However, I will say uh, for companies that are having, that are plugging thousands of these in, you know, saving electricity, you know, is always a, somewhat of a good thing to do, but uh, particularly uh, in case you haven't paid attention, while Apple does sell some iMacs and some Mac Minis and some Mac Studios, you know, one, things that plug into the wall, the vast majority of what Apple sells in the computer in are these laptops, the MacBooks, MacBook, the MacBook Pro, MacBook Air, you know, just the numbers are, you know, significantly more than any, you know, orders of magnitude more than you get in these other products they have. So, so really the, the battery is the game. And so if you're in small business uh, and you're wanting, uh, particularly if you end up having to be mobile in your small business, uh, battery life is a major, major thing uh, for, as a reason for, you know, making use of the Apple laptop, particularly compared to the competition on the Intel or AMD side of things. Okay, so we're up to uh, reason number three of why uh, the Apple products uh, have are good for small business is that typically the they work with minimal or no IT support staff, particularly small companies. You know, I run a small business. I'm a one man operation, you know, but, you know, companies that even just have a few employees or something, if you can have, uh, you know, you want to focus on your business. When you're a small business, you don't have, you, you don't want to spend, you know, you know, you can't afford to hire a full time tech person. <laughs> it's just not an option if you're a company that's, you know, under, say, 20 people or something. And even then, you don't want to do that. You want to focus on what your small business is good about. So, Having tools like the, the Mac, uh, you know, hardware, certainly uh, with its less IT support is extremely beneficial there. And uh, one thing I'll note at the first bullet you'll see here, starting in 2015, you know, that's seven years ago, even IBM has made Macs as an option for all their staff uh, say, hey, you know, you can get a, you know, Mac as well as a Windows and uh, and they were recognizing that it was needing up to uh, three times less uh, staff, uh, excuse me, support staff. So your help desk people to take care of those. So even IBM was recognizing, yes, Macs have certainly have a place in the, the large corporate world. Of course, I'm focusing this presentation on small business like mine. But uh, yes, uh, 
I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, the other thing too, of course, is if you do stick within the Mac ecosystem, as it's called, uh, everything is so seamlessly integrated uh, between the hardware, the operating system and the applications. Uh, it uh, makes for a very uh, smooth user experience. And that's, that's a lot of the goal to you know, make things easy to do on the computer while uh, letting people focus on what their small business is, not on doing tech support of their computer. Where did this file go? How do I do this? Whatever. So, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, Forrester does these studies out there. And one of the studies they showed that uh, particularly, you know, this is in a framework of a corporate environment, but they were showing that corporate environment that has to provide desktop support for a large number of people showed that uh, over three years, when you count the initial cost of the hardware plus the cost of the IT support uh, over three years, that uh, the Apple Max laptops were costing uh, $843 less than getting a Windows computer that uh, needed more support, even though you might save money up front, you know, there's an awful lot to be said about that as a reason why, you know, Apple is a smart decision for the small business. And uh, I, I heartily concur with that. And obviously, uh, as a Apple user group, uh, everybody here agrees on it, but good things to know. So, Okay, uh, reason number four is uh, the actual opposite of what we did. Re reason number three is works with minimal and no IP staff. Reason number four is it does work with IT support staff. Now this used to be an issue, you know, 10, 20 years ago that uh, a lot of the IT staff did not know how to work with uh, Apple uh, uh, hardware and they didn't have a lot of the tools that uh, are needed for um, managing a bunch of, uh, you know, corporate, you know, laptops. So the example here is in the framework of, you know, IT needing to support things. One of the big things is what they call device management. So device management means we've got a, a standard software we want on all your computers and we want to control when things get uh, upgraded and what software you have on your computer that the IT staff can control that and push that out to all of their staff's computers without the staff having to do anything or know anything. They just able to push it out and take care of those things, configure it remotely, and the staff don't even have to know about it. It all just happens. It's called uh, uh, device management. And uh, from Apple, there's a software called Apple Business Manager that lets you uh, control all of those things. And it's not just Macs, it's the iPhones and the iPads and everything. You, you can control all of those things that uh, your company owns. Uh, and then, uh, but Apple Business Manager wasn't the first one out doing that. Jamf was the one that's been around doing it longer, but uh, it's also device management. So there's a, a couple of good options out there for managing a, a bunch of uh, computers if you're wanting to make sure they're all doing the same thing. Uh, another nice thing, particularly if you're doing the Apple Business Manager, is when you're ordering things from the Apple Store, you can have it all pre-configured so that um, when someone's ordering for your, your company, it's going to come with the software you want already on it, already configured for the network, maybe virtual private network or uh, any of these other things. Uh, so you basically set up your business in the, uh, in the Apple store so that anytime you're buying, you know, an Apple product, it'll come configured however you've told the um, Apple business store to configure it for your purchases. So it's kind of nice. Among other things, for example, you obviously want to have some IT account on there so that your IT people can always log in that's different than the staff person's account. So, you know, you can say, hey, make sure this account is on all our computers so that we can log in and, and do things, uh, you know, and update things. So anyway, so even though reason three and reason four are opposite of each other, Apple solves both of those and makes it a good choice for solving things, particularly as you start to become a bigger company, even if you're not just a small business like me. Okay, uh, we just have to mention this. Some, some ways we kind of cringe and other ways we welcome it, but <laughs> business world lives and works on Microsoft Office, either as the app or in the cloud. And it is just, you know, what the business world does. So if you're going to uh, 
uh, send things to other people in the business world, you're going to expect to send, you know, Apple spreadsheets, PowerPoints, which you notice, of course, I'm not using a, a PowerPoint, but I could, but, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft Word, Word is kind of the de facto um, business uh, word processor, you know, Outlook is the email one. So all of those things are fully supported by Microsoft on the Apple uh, OS and those are uh, important for the business world. And uh, if you're in the business world, you just end up having to do it. So cringe and send Microsoft some of your money for that. It, it works well and seamless. So, you know, while I uh, prefer the uh, Apple ecosystem, the nice thing is if I need to do stuff with other businesses that are all in the Microsoft world, uh, my Microsoft office is going to work with all of them just fine. So, and uh, that is certainly a positive. Uh, for the uh, a reason why the Apple uh, ecosystem makes for great small business solutions. Um, I don't use this much, but there are a lot of people out there, particularly the younger generation that are into the Google workspace. So uh, if you are, uh, Apple works the Safari as well as Chrome on the Mac, works just fine with all of the Google workspace stuff. Some of the things you do need to use the Chrome browser, but uh, you know, if you want to create documents and share them and do the, their email and their, you know, presentation stuff, and Google has a bunch of things out there. Uh, of course, there's, you know, always the, you know, it's, you know, how much are you going to sell your soul of putting all your business on their hardware, but, you know, it's, it, it works. So, you know, if that's where you're at, I know a lot of uh, kids getting out of college are really onto it because since it, often cost them little or nothing. They, they've been using Google Workspace all through college. So uh, they're, they're used to doing that. So anyway, reason number six is Google Workspace works great with Apple Macs. Reason seven, now this really isn't about small business, but I do have to mention this. And uh, reason seven, um, you know, I don't know how common it is in the uh, consumer world, but in the business world, SAP is one of the big enterprise uh, softwares and a large portion of the um, Fortune 500 companies all use uh, SAP corporately. It has all kinds of interesting tools. They are uh, basically generally harder to use, but more capable. Um, they're done at an enterprise level where it's all done on enterprise mainframes and um, there's a lot that the enterprise controls everything about it. And so if you're a large corporate, you know, organization, SAP makes a lot of sense. Uh, and in case you don't know, Apple is an SAP company. So if you're going to work for Apple, you're going to use SAP. <laughs> you're going to do it down to doing your time cards. Everything is, is done through SAP. So just be aware that uh, at least on the large corporate side of things, it, it certainly is is the big big uh, iron out there now more than say you think of you know IBM and its solutions. So, okay. Someone had a comment there. Okay, I'll keep going here. Um, Dropbox. Now, this is more common uh, in the small business world uh, where people want to store and share a few files among each other. You want to do file sharing, but a lot of people uh, don't want to have their own uh, network storage or they don't know how to configure it to have access to it. And if you do need to do, uh, do that, you need to go back to Lawrence's presentation on how easy it is to do. But uh, but there are a lot of people in the small business world that don't want to figure that out. Dropbox is an easy way to store things in the cloud just for your company. And, uh, and then you can also uh, expose some of it to share that for, uh, you know, clients that want to get something, particularly if they just want to download something. So Dropbox is a great uh, place to, you know, store documents and share them with uh, colleagues or co customers and clients and certainly is a big thing in the small business world. Um, personally, uh, I think Lawrence has it right with a Synology and local storage, but uh, it's also what I do at, at my little small business. I have a little Synology network attached storage that's available over the internet and uh, it serves up uh, great file sharing. So anyway, but this is certainly, reason number eight is one thing that a lot of small businesses use and Apple plays very well with it. 
Speaking of Synology, uh, I just uh, was mentioning it, but I'll just show you the box here. This is a, one of the larger, um, well, they actually make a lot bigger ones, but to me, this is a large one. Lawrence, is that considered large to you? <laughs> it's very large. There we go, there we go. So anyway, it gets expensive when you start putting all those drives or SSDs in there. But yes, that's what's called network attached storage. That means it's a storage device that you can access over your local area network or the wide area network through the internet. And it has basically a bunch of drives on there. And then it has usually in the case of Synology, it's a little Linux server on it that um, uh, let you manage and control, you know, who has access to it, what type of encryption there is, and all those things. Uh, I will tell you how I ended up on Synology for doing my uh, company's local storage is years ago, Apple had a wonderful product. Uh, they had the, uh, the Apple Mac server that did all of these things for you. It was a great tool. Uh, Steve Jobs made sure it happened. Um, uh, under Tim Cook's reign, they've decided it is not something they want to do. Uh, I hardly disagreed with that, but that meant when it went away, it went away and we had to figure out something to do. So uh, I was uh, reading on the Apple Insider saying, you know, if I want to do all these things that the Apple Mac server used to do, file sharing, email, web services, things like that. What is something that's friendly out there without me just having to buy, you know, a Linux server and know all this command line stuff and, you know, you know, I want to do something the easy way I want to, I'm used to an Apple Mac I'm used to a graphical user interface I'm used to, you know, help tools so anyway, the on the Apple insider there was an article that was posted that said that, well, it certainly isn't the uh, Apple Mac server. <clears throat> Synology comes the closest to it they've got what they call the DSM uh console which is their administration console for configuring this server and it actually is well it is all user interface and it actually is fairly easy to integrate bring more uh, apps and tools into and manage things uh, and so i've gotten to be where since apple has abandoned this this area of things uh, i'm i found synology is a reasonable uh uh, a tool to work that works well with my Apple Mac. However, I would, if I was saying reason nine, I really would prefer if it was Apple was doing a server, but without it, you know, you do need to use some third party things that are not Apple. And here, here's what I've done for the storage stuff. So uh, of course, reason 10, we've talked about a number of other things, uh, uh, softwares out there. But, you know, Apple makes a lot of great software itself. <laughs> so you know, I'm, what I'm doing the presentation on, it's Keynote. And I think it hands down beats uh, the PowerPoint from Microsoft that, you know, most of the business world uses. So, um, but, you know, if you're in the business stuff, uh, numbers and pages are very good uh, for doing uh, spreadsheets and, uh, designing, uh, you know, newsletters or things like that. Uh, so uh, certainly they, they have some very capable tools. They've got also a lot of other consumer things that are probably not so business related, such as GarageBand or iMovie. But then again, I find myself using, you know, iMovie for some business stuff here and there. <coughs> so, um, you know, it's pretty powerful stuff and it works very seamlessly together, which is really nice about all the Apple software and they are very good at making sure that it works. If they say it's gonna work, they, they are behind it working, just working out of the box, version one. You know, I'm almost never afraid of a version one product from Apple. Um, it has been very rare that I've gotten burned on that. They've had a few missteps, but in general they haven't. So uh, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Okay, well, uh, I remember there's a time that we hardly worried about security and our passwords were all, you know, one, two, three, or the word password, or, you know, let me in, or, you know, one of these, you know, password one, two, three, four. And so we, security was, you know, used to not be a, such a big issue. But in the last decade, security is everything because it's not only the, um, hackers out there trying to get in on you. It's the uh, the governments are trying to get onto you. And, you know, if it's not your government, it's someone else's government. Uh, I can tell you just from monitoring my server that, you know, I get lots of hits from North Korea and China and, you know, uh, 
Russia, Ukraine, a lot of things that have no business hitting my server. And so you, you know, they're out fishing for things. And uh, it's just the reality of being on the wide uh, World Wide Web. Uh, Apple has done a very good job of hardening their operating system. Now, if you want to benefit from this, that means you need to keep up on your hardware and your operating system updates. So you need to make sure you are pushing through. Apple has made it very easy to do these updates, but you have to stick on them. When your computer gets old past about six years, uh, you need to make sure that you're upgrading and, and, and getting a new one right, Shirley, so that you'll be current and have the latest security. Hey, Shirley. <laughs> Tried to talk her into upgrading. By the way, Linda Reese just upgraded, so I'm impressed too, so woo. <laughs> so, well, after you tell me exactly what kind to get, I'll upgrade. Oh, But uh, I did upgrade the security thing to 15 point somebody or other. Yes, yes. Well, they got the new uh, Apple uh, Apple Air, uh, Apple MacBook Air with uh, M2 processor starting at $999. <coughs> quite a deal, quite a deal. Um, I will also mention, you know, there's um, uh, in the security, uh, one thing I'll mention that a lot of people don't know the name of, see Gatekeeper, that second from the bottom one down there. That is what is constantly trying to keep uh, uh, viruses and things coming in over the, uh, the web or through your browser. Uh, Apple has always had built-in uh, software trying to uh, keep viruses from attacking and taking over. And it's just been part of the operating system all along. It's not like when you were on Microsoft uh, years ago, you used to have to get third-party stuff and finally Microsoft realized, oh, you need to build it in just like Apple. People don't want to even know that it's there. They just want to have <coughs> security built in. Well, Apple does that and they don't even brag or talk much about it. It's just included as part of buying an Apple Mac. So definitely a valid reason for a small business to use uh, an Apple Mac. Uh, obviously, since <coughs> Apple Macs uh, are, you know, Macs are made by Apple, which makes the iPhone, well, they love each other. And there's a wonderful seamless ecosystem uh, and many things on it from <coughs> the iPhone and the Mac. There's the same softwares on a lot of them and you can uh, share things easily and they're made to work together. Uh, a specific effort is made by Apple to make those things work well with each other. And so that's a, a big deal. Uh, now, I have to throw this out there. A lot of you know, I'm a FileMaker de developer. FileMaker is made by Claris, which is wholly owned by Apple. And I make custom business software for other small businesses. And I make it for Macs and iPads and iPhones. And it's an example of the Apple software, you know, or made by Claris here that uh, uh, works seamlessly between all, all of their uh, Apple products. <clears throat> so it really is a, a wonderful reason that in the small business world, if I need a custom business solution, I can do that. There's a tool made by Apple to de design and do that. That's the Claris uh, FileMaker Pro software. And there's a whole community out there of us developers that do that. There are about 1,400 of us certified companies that are Claris partners to do these types of things. So I'm one of those out there, but there are a whole lot of others. And it lets you as a small business, um, you know, you don't have to get something just off the shelf. If you need something custom designed for your business and you need to work on your Mac or your iPad or your iPhone or all together, <coughs> uh, FileMaker is the tool to do that. So I uh, hope you guys think wonders of FileMaker. I sure do. And that's why I'm in the business with it. <laughs> Uh, kind of like we've also mentioned, you know, Microsoft and Google, uh, Adobe certainly has its software out there. Uh, it's more uh, if you're in, if you're a small business that needs to do marketing and uh, deal with videos, pictures, or graphics, uh, Adobe has the tools for those. Uh, there are a lot of small businesses that don't need Adobe, but uh, if you are, um, you know, I use them from, you know, Dreamweaver to Photoshop to, you know, their InDesign desktop publishing to, you know, uh, uh, I make use of some of those things, but there are a whole lot of software on there that I don't even make use of. 
but uh, Adobe works wonderfully with uh, the Apple uh, OS. And so reason 14 for small business to use an Apple is uh, Adobe software. <coughs> All the graphics and uh, artistic anything is fully supported on uh, an Apple Mac. So we come to uh, the end of things and just kind of like we were mentioning, a lot of these things just work with uh, the Apple and uh, it is what small business wants to do. Uh, usually a small business wants to focus on its small business. They just want to get some computer hardware that just works, <coughs> that doesn't take up a lot of their uh, time and lets their employees focus on what it is that makes them money. So <coughs> that kind of winds up the presentation part of it. Let me turn over and see if you guys have any questions about why Apple uh, hardware and Macs makes for great uh, uh, tools for a small business. I think one of the things that um, really comes to mind, and I, you didn't have it in there, but I would have added one more thing is tech support. They have very good tech support. I have had problems and I can call them up at seven o'clock at night and say, I'm stuck and there's somebody there to help. Amen to that. And they have like genius bars and uh, all kinds of uh, things, even in the stores. But yes, the uh, online support is great. How about Touch ID? How many devices have it? And when they start using it on a lot of devices, they see it in I iPads, iPhones, Macs. Uh, how, how pervasive was it uh, uh, with that's it. <laughs> well, in the uh, general PC world, Apple has somewhere around I think fifteen percent of the market. Uh, so it's so you know, certainly a small player. But you know, um, you know, for example, if you compare it, it's you know multiple times sizer than bigger than uh, say BMW is in the car market. Yet nobody considers BMW a failure. You know, Apple. Apple focus on its little niche market that it does to make things easy and just work. And uh, it seems to certainly have its, uh, uh, you know, section of the market. And if anything, I think it's growing, particularly when it provides hardware that uh, there are no solutions on the Intel side of things, such as I need a laptop that's going to last all day. And I don't, you know, I don't want to carry around a bunch of spare batteries. Well, Apple solving it. If you followed um, Apple in the stock market for the last month, um, they are one of the strongest uh, NASDAQ stocks out there. And mm -hmm. uh, again, approaching a, a $3 trillion company. I used to always okay. chuckle and say, why is not Apple on, uh, you know, the Dow Jones? And of course, if you looked at it, it would have totally messed up their numbers. But anyway, because it throws the numbers so high. <laughs> I was thinking about fingerprint recognition on the, the, the newest devices. Do you know when it all started on everything? No, but it, uh, the fingerprint thing works great. Uh, I make a lot of use of it on my, my Mac, uh, and I think it is something that uh, is just part of their security uh, integration that they, they do an excellent job of security all around from you know accessing it uh, with biometrics to the regular security stuff to just uh, encryption at, at storage, encryption over the network. So... All of those things are very important. I've even, if you really read about the fingerprint stuff, there's there's some ridiculous stuff that you don't even want to know about. For example, they showed that, for example, if you chopped off someone's finger and then tried to use it on the thing, well, because the temperature isn't right, it wouldn't work. So you can't even just chop someone's finger off and then bring it over and be able to <laughs> access the laptop. So I mean, yeah, it, it really is handy, and it really is handy on the web to just touch the fingerprint and put in your passwords and things. Okay. Uh, I have a question about Dropbox. Yes. I am so frustrated trying to get Dropbox to quit grabbing my screenshots. And I've read and done everything. I even, one, one place they said, well, 
there's something you have to create a new user and do something there. So I did that and I still cannot get Dropbox to quit grabbing my screenshots. What, what does it do? Is it pulling them off of your desktop or something? Yeah, if you do a screenshot, it goes to Dropbox instead of putting it on the desktop. Oh. It's just, uh, I don't know. I You're don't gonna know have why. To, I guess. There's got to be a P list somewhere that lets you control where that goes from. Um, I'd have to look that up, but I might follow up with you on that, Ray, that we there's a, a default, one of your yeah, it, libraries. It's a long-standing problem with a bunch of Dropbox users and they've kind of said, well, you're just too dumb to do what we're telling you. And uh, well, that's not a good answer. <laughs> it's certainly in the really, app that's, answer. <laughs> kind of, that's kind of the answer you get when, well, we've already posted that 15 times, you know. Or right. you can do like, right. uh, you know, Lawrence and I do the Synology thing. Oh, and, yeah. I'd love to do Synology. Sure. Would. Have you, have you tried? Ray, go into the Dropbox preferences under import and turn off where it says share screenshots with Dropbox. Yes, yes I have. Just doesn't seem to work. Okay. Yeah, I've tried everything I can okay. find. Wow. Uh, I, uh, maybe I'll put in a plug for pages uh, because I've never been in a business environment, I really don't need Microsoft Office. And although I have it, I've never used it. And of course, Pages can open a Word document. And if you create something in Pages, you can export it as a Word document. But um, I'm... I've learned a lot about pages. Uh, I've been working on a book for <laughs> two or three years. I'm about to publish a 200 page book and I've done it all in uh, pages. And uh, the, uh, the solution, the print solution today anywhere, I guess, is the PDF. And Pages great, makes great PDFs that you can have printed anywhere without any problem. And some of us remember when you had to upload the fonts and all of that. Well, not anymore. Anyway, uh, I've really come to enjoy Pages and I've learned a lot about it. I learned one thing just this last week on... Um, I think I posted it, an easy way to replace a, an illustration. Uh, and I, that was something I'd always wanted to do. Uh, for example, you wanna, you wanna take out a, a low res illustration and put in a high resolution. And uh, anyway, there's, there's a whole lot to it and some of it's kind of hidden but um, Pages is a really good publishing program, writing and publishing. Certainly, certainly. So who else is running a small business on their Mac here? Anyone else in the group? I, uh, I'm not running a small business, but um, <laughs> I kind of did. And so, um, but I am running a server and I am, uh, can, uh, can, it's good, good. And I've worked in IT and Apple's come a long way of meeting with standards. And so they fit in very well with the IT and in business, which they used to have a little confrontation with. And now it's like, I think it all came from the iPhone. People started bringing the iPhones to work and infiltrating like a disease and it just, uh, and it just took over. So 
I think now it doesn't matter if you have a Mac and you bring it in. I've seen more Macs in more places than I ever seen before. So, Hey, Lawrence, question. Uh, I left the yes. federal government back in 2013, and back then it was an all-Microsoft juggernaut, and they were not about to let Apple in. And of course, I kept asking, but it's an American company. Why aren't we supporting an American company? But uh, there, there was uh, the federal government where I was working, there was ha- they weren't going to have anything to do with an Apple Mac, uh, anything. So, uh, well, the what, federal what government like now, federal government now uses all Apple I- iPhones. That's all I have, and all Apple um, iPads. The only thing they still hold off on is we. I use a Dell computer uh, right now, but everything else is uh, every iPhone back. It, when uh, BlackBerry went out of business and um, Apple proved that their security was as superior or equal to BlackBerry, that's all they had to do and everything went from BlackBerry to Apple. Well, the other thing too is BlackBerry was a Canada company. I was like, why aren't we supporting our own country? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. They are now. They are now. And I'm uh, I'm I can't hardly wait to see my first MacBook Pro. Hey, Ray, I think I found your answer. Okay. Okay, press command shift five. All right. And when the box comes up, check on the options. All right. And go to where it says save to and pick other location. Uh, other locations yes sir. others location yes under save two and uncheck dropbox pick something else pick your desktop or something well boy i'll sure give that a try <laughs> <laughs> the Tim to the wow <laughs> publish that in the apple gram i don't know i don't know why that afflicted me but i sure thank you that's the snap, it's under the snap it's in the snapshots app sorry to interrupt your conversation there but well and see i had to figure I that out about that that was in that uh, app that was a way to do it yeah i never got it done i'll i'll let you know if it works in a minute. okay sorry to interrupt hey, the conversation uh, there. taylor yeah did you uh you might want to comment on the web link that uh, Paul posted about a vulnerability, a security vulnerability. I never had seen it before. I just got it. I haven't read it myself. This is Paul. Yeah, I, I looked it up, Paul, and it's talk. It's it's when you, it's when you sign off your Mac. There's they found a. And I guess Apple has already patched it, but. Uh, yeah. Well, but they've also only patched it on the current version of the operating system. This is another reason why you got to keep doing your updates. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. I guess there'll always be something else and they just have to keep fighting it. So you keep keep updated and you're, you're in pretty good shape. Thanks for sharing that, Paul. All right, I'm curious about something. I want to use something as my uh, uh, home screen on my phone in my photo library. It doesn't quite fit. Is there some software that I can use to um, change the size of a photo to a number of different number of pixels or something or other? Well, any any image graphics program. I use Photoshop, but there are a lot of others that are cheaper and easier out there. What about preview? Will it allow me to uh, resize something? Maybe I can make a screenshot of that? I think you can crop, but I don't think you can resize in preview. There was something I- When you go in preview and save or export, it ought to give you an option to change the, the resolution of it. I use preview a lot because I don't own Photoshop or anything. So okay, I'll go experiment. Yeah. Preview is an underutilized app. It really is. 
that that's another thing when I'm, I've been sitting at home and um, there's, you'd be surprised when you have a piece of software, a lot of stuff in the software that you don't realize is in there unless you have time to explore. And I've been coming up with a lot of Apple software, um, fantastic calc, uh, those type of things has really been, uh, been great. Um, Taylor, yes. I got a question for you. Can you bring up the user interface to Synology so people can see how friendly it is? Sure. <laughs> Let's see, screen share. How do I turn screen share back on? <clears throat> screen share. Now it certainly isn't Apple standard, so this is just, it's a compromise, but... Um, We'll see how fast this hotel connection is here. So you get my fingerprint. Okay, this we are now in it. I've got my con control panels, so things open as you know windows are closed. So you can move them around and stuff. So it's a lot of it is. GUI like so you have this up here where you can you know log in and see all kinds of you know different things that I've installed here so I've got uh, everything from docker to hyper backup I got my running my web pages right here so for example this gives me a bunch of the web pages I'm running right now including look the Raymac one yes it is running too but uh, these are all well, that where I am, huh? Yeah, yeah, that, that's where you are at. <laughs> so, but you know, you know, things can be resized and changed. It is certainly not as elegant as the Apple operating system, but um, it does seem to work reasonably well. And it's all a graph <laughs> user interface, and uh, and they have all kinds of additional. Uh, these are software. <laughs> aimed at server server software so it's all running on this linux software but there's a, a linux operating system but there's a whole herd of things here what what they do though is they take each of these uh, uh, other uh, kind of mainframe server software things and they have they build the user interface to make it work uh, in here so i don't have to know how to for example i run you know mail station or oauth or whatever radius server you know and so i uh, they build the the kind of the user interface front end that lets me select choices instead of having to know all the command line things so uh which is certainly what i want because i want to you know as a small business i don't want to be an it you know server manager I, you know i want to support me instead of you know me becoming a professional in that i want to focus on my business not not being a you know it person so this all works real well, and uh, I I like it. It's got a great the file station lets you see all the you know file sharings that we have going on, and all the different you know files and backups and uh, various things. And these are all things that I can connect to externally on my Mac using, uh, for example, see this right here. Look at all of these. So I'm going to come back here to my Finder, and I'm going to uh, connect to that same server. And I'll connect to that same folder here. <coughs> and so what I'm going to see, let's see. So if you look here, I'll do it this way. This is on my Mac, and this is on the Linux Synology box right here. It's, you know, I'm seeing the same things. So uh, you can connect using Apple File Protocol. You can connect using SMB, the Microsoft standard. You can connect using FTP or Secure FTP or uh, FTP Secure, which is different than Secure FTP. <laughs> but 
Uh, you know, it supports all these different things for ways to connect and file share, which is really useful if you're a small business and say, I want to be able to share these things with my customers or other businesses and things like that. Work, works really great. So, and it tends to be highly reliable. Any other questions on uh, the Synology DSM? I don't know. Lawrence, what does DSM stand for? Uh, uh, that's a good question. It stands for Disk <laughs> Management. Disk Station Manager. Disk Station Manager. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Tim's on top of it. <laughs> it must be that massive computer behind Tim there. <laughs> I, do, I do have a question about Synology now that I've seen some of the things. That, I have a small Synology that I've talked about before that runs Plex, but could I get a bigger Synology to also let me host my own web page? I've got a very simple web page, my personal web page. You know, and I pay the fee to have HostGator do it and all that. It's coming up for renewal and it's kind of expensive. Can I buy a bigger Synology and just do it myself? Well, why does your current one not do it? Don't you have this station manager on it? Yeah, it does. It, you know, it might. I, yeah, I could then it already, it I, already does it. Your, your biggest issue is, are you going to do something like no IP or are you going to actually buy an IP for your local computer? But if you, if you get an IP for it, you know, it's already built in, you know, the current one you have with the disk station manager, you just, uh, and they actually have multiple different here. Uh, I'll show you. Um, I'm using, uh, let's see. Richard, I was going to do that too, and it was real easy to set that up. Except the only hitch is that I have to have a a, a, a standard—I'm not a standard, but a static IP address—and that costs more money. But that has nothing to do with um, Synology. It has something to do with the life of having a stat, uh, having a business with a, a static IP address. If you had any kind of server, you would have to have that. And I'm, I'm thinking yeah, oh. that's going to change soon as now that IPv6s are out there and basically they've got unlimited, unlimited number of IPs. Uh, the fact that they're charging to get a static IP on an IPv4 is ridiculous. You should just say, give me an IPv6 and you, you, that shouldn't cost you anything. But I, I use this web station here, um, but they also have Apache and like another, another they, so they've got several different uh, web services out there. You can run run them at the same time on the same computer, but uh, this this is the one I like because it just was seemed real easy for me to set up, and it was the first one I saw uh, called WebStation, and it lets you uh, uh, set up all the, uh, you know, IPs you want here. Now, the other thing, too, is you need to uh, have your uh, DNS uh, point to this, you know, IP for, you know, these domains. Uh, and if you want, you know, uh, uh, you can either use a, a DNS that you have out, say on GoDaddy or something like this, but uh, I've got my own uh, DNS uh, right here on Synology that I use. So, you know, it's, um, here's my DNS server right here on Synology. So here are all the, the domains that I'm, some of them that I'm running right now. So. So I would still have to pay somebody to register my domain yeah, I do. It's I go go daddy. It's fifteen dollars a year, and and then what I can do is create a domain name, and then as Taylor said, what you can do is just in in GoDaddy point the IP address in GoDaddy to your IP address that you set up in your Synology, and you're ready to go. And it's only fifteen dollars a year. The advantage or, of that is you don't have to run your own DNS. Uh, there's right. advantages of running your own DNS, but the, the biggest disadvantage of running your own DNS is you're required to run two of them. So <laughs> do you buy two Synologies? <laughs> well, <laughs> you probably don't want to do that. So one of the advantages uh, of, you know, running using GoDaddy's DNS, because it comes with it, uh, usually when you're buying a domain from them is, you know, it's no big deal just to use theirs. 
Um, I currently pay HostGator to register the domain every year. It's $30, which, you know, it's twice what you're saying, but that's a little bit in the noise. I'm, I'm more concerned. I'm on the hook for about $500 for their web hosting service renewal. Yeah. I really would like to avoid that. Yeah, come over to this. This is, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can buy another Synology for that much. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, what, uh, I guess one of the questions is, uh, what is your internet service provider? I use AT&T Uverse, so I've got the gig internet. It's it's nice and fast. Okay, do they uh, uh, see if you can get an IP from them? They may make you go up to a, a business line to do it, but uh, that's mm. that's the main thing that you have to do. I mean, okay. it's, not, it's not near as bad as it used to be. I'm, I'm spending about 150 a month for 32 IPs. So uh, that, you know, that's the gig up and down. And, you know, that's a business line. That's not a residential. Uh, so it obviously is going to cost a lot less than that because you'd only be looking for one IP, but, you know. So that cost would be in addition to what I pay for my thousand up and down every month? No, it, it'd be, no, that, that, that includes your, what you're already paying. Okay. This, this is their business line with all of those IPs. So you, you would be less than that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, at that rate, you are using a shared line. So you are using shared fiber with other people in your neighborhood, but that tends yeah. not to be that big of a deal performance wise. I test the performance all the time and I never get under like 900. So, um, you, you know, the converse is you can also buy a business line that is dedicated uh, to you at that speed, but those run about 2,200 to 2,500 a month. And that's a big step from 150 a month. <laughs> but I, 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 I have fiber into my house and I'm doing the gig and I've never dropped below 800. And so I'm sure you won't have a problem with uh, running a server, especially if it's just one website, one website page, you know. Yeah, and it's a very, it's a very simple web page. Page for one site. Right, right. It's a very simple web page. My Plex, you know, uh, does take advantage of that thousand up and down um, a lot more, and I've never had a, a problem with that either. One thing it cost, how much would it cost minimum, roughly, to have a web page on your server using the smallest synergy that they make? This rough magnitude of dollars. I, I bought mine, I paid something like um, total with drives and everything. I have two drives, I think they're uh, eight eight maybe they're four they're four terabytes a piece and um which is too small i should have spent just a little bit more money and got more and the synology and i think it was under five hundred dollars how much under five hundred dollars i'm i'm i'd have to look it might have been like 390 or something tim is going to look it up for me because he's always looking stuff up. So look it up for me and tell me how much the cheapest Synology, the one I have, the, the 2020 plus. I think it's like sometimes on sale for, I bought mine from Amazon and I think it was, uh, I don't know. Old, sometimes things like that. Just, if I go to sleep, I lose it. I did, I put a link to Lawrence's uh, July presentation, which was great on our ACD webpage. So you can always click on that and then go to what Taylor told us about Synology. And there's an Amazon link in there too. And realize this, these prices here are the entry level stuff. Uh, the, the Synology box I'm running costs me with storage and all about $4,500. And they go up a whole lot more. You can, they actually have Synology boxes that are six figure boxes too. So that are really storage area networks instead of network attached storage but uh, but they have a nice low level entry level stuff too 
Synology boxes that are very reasonably priced. But you got to be real careful. Go back down um, and to that the one that was one hundred and eighty nine dollars, one hundred and eighty nine dollars. I'm not sure if that one runs the um, the 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 web servers and everything. I think you got to go up to the one that I have, which is the one above that, which was two ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Web server. I may be wrong, but but when you're doing your research, make sure you check to see if that one eighty nine will do though. Well, well web notice server. these prices say diskless, so that is what yes. the cost. And then you have to buy drives with it, and uh, of course they're all different size of drives you want to sp and spend and they can cost all kinds of amount of money but uh, realize when you're looking at these prices you need to also include the price of whatever drives you want to put in and you can put in whatever size you want but it gets more expensive if you get bigger drives or if you go to ssd you can put ssds in but those cost a whole lot more <laughs> and they're very easy to put in all i did was undo the drive stick it in a little uh holder a cage and took that cage and stuck it in the front and i was ready to go i yeah, can i can add one one comment to that don't buy the 2020 or the 220j you'll be disappointed with the performance mm. well i bet you're gonna spend you the money you're gonna spend the you'd get better performance yeah you need the plus don't buy the j i had i actually have a j that, that i was very disappointed with the performance. So I moved up to a plus. <laughs> Here you can get a $10,000 one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there, depending on what your storage needs are, there are a lot of different Synology boxes. So, but yes, they are. Uh, I really rather like uh, the Synology uh, solutions out there. It's a, it's a aimed at small business of trying to make uh, managing uh storage easy plus unlike a lot of other network attached storage their dsm software it lets you do a lot of other things like web pages and emails and stuff like that so um, is there going to be a lot of cost for security if you're using that for a website well, there's you. That's what you buy when you get the DSM. It comes with a security. I mean, you you have to buy a a certificate, but you know, yeah, you know, SSL security certificate bill, pretty much bail can. Well, I mean, it's SSL security. It's you know, it's the same security that you're using to connect to your bank or whatever. So, it's whatever you type in HTTPS on your browser. So you don't have to buy anything else to get that if you buy the NAS. Well, you do have to buy it kind of like you have to buy the domain name from GoDaddy. You have to buy the certificate from them, but you just install it on here and it, it works. The certificate's going to cost you 60 bucks or something, 60, 70 bucks. Okay. <clears throat> Pretty good stuff. Okay. Well, we have finished our hour here, so I'm going to wind things down. Richard, who's who's presenting next month? What's our deal? Next month, we uh, should have a video presentation again from Drew Richmond. Yeah. He's going to talk to us this time about book publishing. So, Ray, this might be right up your alley. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I look forward to joining everybody next month second saturday of the uh, month uh, which i'm not sure what date that is but uh it will certainly be fun let's see is it up up on our web page here let's see well, that's today and then there's our stuff here's our wonderful web page thank you richard by the way if you guys haven't ever watched this how it all happened it's it's an older video, but it is. Uh, I really enjoy that one. Thank you, Ray. That was certainly fun. Thanks. Yes, I liked it, Ray. A matter of fact, I just kind of <laughs> reminds me of how of the good old days. Oh, yeah. yeah, good old days. <laughs> hey, Ray, on the I mean, uh, sorry, Taylor, on the web page, I I put in the. Um, link you gave me or the address and it just comes up with this blank page of yours that says uh, file maker databases well, 
I just clicked on it. It still says filemaker.taylor. No, 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 okay, hey, hold up. Go in there and see where it says show details. Click on show details. Well, well, what he needs to do is change this right here. This file maker. Oh, okay. This is what I was saying. This that is the old URL. We've got a new URL. This has to be fm.tms.us. And if you change it to that, it'll work. Oh, okay. So I I didn't have the rest of that on there. <clears throat> I see. Yeah, that's why I was saying just edit the one that's there. I've messed it up already. Can you text me that entire link? Then I can just paste it in. Yeah. Go to the chat thing here. No. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you for allowing the chat and good morning. Dang. Okay, there it is in the, the chat thing. Thank you. Hey Richard, what mm -hmm. is your where is your web page? ACD.us. Yeah, it's hostgator, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, you mean my personal meant, page? I thought you meant you had a uh, personal web page or a business page. Uh, oh. rlvintage.tech. Vintage.tech. Great. RL, put RL on the front of that. rlvintage.tech. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording at this point. So here we go. Recording, good, good scene, everybody. Recording is stopped.